Our next presenter is Dr. Sarah Villa. She's a professor in the entomology department and an extension specialist. She is a biologist by training and has recently begun to integrate information about climate change in the various extension programs. Sarah leads the new climate science for farmers extension team in the agricultural program and is working to provide Maryland's farmers with information that will help them minimize the problems that climate change is already causing for crops and livestock. So today she'll be presenting the presentation titled Adaptation Strategies for Climate Change. So now I would like to turn the screen over. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to have the chance to follow Tony's excellent talk. Uh, he really laid most of the groundwork for what I'll be talking about. And I, I want to start out by just reiterating Tony's take-home message, which is that climate change is already here and it's going to get worse. Uh, and if we don't do anything to rein in our carbon emissions, it's going to get a lot worse. So that's business as usual. Um, that means that this is a really good time to start making some changes. And when we think about farming or you think about managing your farm, this is a great time to think about how you might start to implement some changes that will uh, allow you to manage the risk from climate change, um, at least uh, the short-term risk over the next few de decades. So... Uh, so I wanted to just start out with uh, pointing out that last year was the hottest year ever since temp temperature records began to be taken uh, by quite a uh, large amount. So 2000, this is, these are the uh, four warmest years ever. You can see they're all since 2010. 2016 was much warmer than previous years. And I'll just point out this is the temperature axis here. But you notice that it starts at point. 08. So this is actually a lot more, uh, a lot warmer than the average temperatures between 1881 and 1910 than it, than it seems. Uh, so I'm often asked when I, when I go out and speak to people, how do we know that the extreme temperatures that we're experiencing now aren't just part of a natural cycle? Because we all know that temperatures go up and down and um, that we know that carbon dioxide has gone up and down over the years. And so this is, it looks a little complicated, but this is a graph that, that shows us the um, information from now, which is the present, back, uh, back 800,000 years. And um, it shows the fluctuations in carbon dioxide up and down, up and down, and those correspond to um, sort of coupled changes in temperature, which goes up and down, up and down. So it is totally true that carbon dioxide and temperature have always fluctuated. Um, let me just um, answer a question that might be in some of your minds. How do we know what the carbon dioxide was 800,000 years ago? Uh, we weren't there, uh, but very smart scientists can take ice cores in the Antarctic, and um, you know how ice is a little white. Well, that white in the ice is air, and they can take that 800,000-year-old air out and determine how much carbon dioxide is in it. So we do have a pretty good, they call it proxy record of the carbon dioxide fluctuations. If you look over this whole long period, uh, you can see that the carbon dioxide has never been over 300 parts per million over 800,000 years. Now in 2013, we exceeded 400 parts per million, and now we're at like 405 parts per million. So this allows us to make a rock solid scientific inference, which is whatever factors, and we know what they are, but whatever factors cause this fluctuation, okay, can't have caused this because it is so far out of the normal range that it must be caused by something else. So this is how we know that the situation we're in now isn't part of uh, nature as we know it. Also, um, the temperature trace doesn't jack up very fast because it takes a while to catch up and this is a very compressed time scale. So this is how we know that we're in a new situation. Um, and just to reiterate, um, the problem with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is basically the following. So he, uh, the solar radiation comes in and warms up the Earth. Heat leaves the Earth through infrared waves that go out into space. But the problem is that these little dots, uh, this is the atmosphere, this little area, these little dots represent greenhouse gas molecules. And whenever one of these infrared waves hits a greenhouse gas molecule, it is bounced off in a random direction. So half the time, they'll come back to Earth. 
okay, like this. And the more of these greenhouse gas molecules are in the atmosphere, the more bouncing around those infrared waves do before they can get out. So the take-home message is more gas molecules, slower heat loss, same amount of heat's being generated by the sun, more warming. You warm the place up, you can't, you can't let the heat out fast enough, the air is going to warm up. That's just uh, basic physics. Okay, so another thing I'm often asked is, okay, we have all this extra CO2. Isn't this good for plants? And uh, it's sort of a yes, but mostly no story. Yes, CO2 is used by plants in photosynthesis, so more CO2 should be good. But the problem is as CO2 rises in the atmosphere, the temperature rises, so the soil moisture decreases because it's evaporating uh, more. As Tony said, summer droughts are going to be more frequent. Um, and when the plants sense that they're losing too much moisture, so here, we, let's go down to this cross section of a leaf here. Here's the top. On the bottom, leaves have these little openings called stoma or stomates for plural, and the carbon dioxide goes in there. Um, as they're open, oxygen leaves, but also water leaves. So when the plant detects that too much water is being lost because it's very warm out and the moisture is, soil moisture is low, these stomates, these little openings, close up, okay? So you can have all the carbon dioxide in the world, but when these are closed up, the plant is not photosynthesizing. So um, the net effect of increased carbon dioxide is negative for plants. The carbon dioxide out there can't be used for photosynthesis because the plant stops taking in carbon dioxide and losing water. Okay, so what we're in now is basically uh, what's called the new normal. We have warmer air, a warmer ocean. I haven't talked about that, but 90% of the increased temperature, increased heat in the air has been taken up by the ocean. More water vapor in the air because more is evaporating from the ocean and warmer air holds more water. A higher sea level. This means that we have, will have more severe weather and more extreme extremes. So Tony covered that, I think, very well. The weather is also going to be more variable. So this past Saturday, 70 degrees at my house. Sunday, 45 degrees. Um, it's, we're getting a lot of extremely variable weather. Warmer winters, earlier springs, hotter summers. More of our rainfall is coming as downpours, which leads to um, increases in flash flooding. In Maryland, we are going to have rainier springs and falls but drier summers. So these things have an impact on agriculture. And what I want to do is to lay out some of these impacts and then also discuss um, what we can do about it, at least in the short term. Oh, sorry, for those of you on the eastern shore uh, or along the bay, we're going to have a lot more tidal flooding and storm surge. Okay, so um, just a month or so ago, NOAA released uh, some state-specific data, which I think is very useful for us to look at. And so what we can um, see here is, is a bunch of, of these graphs that look like this. So let me just explain to you how to read this. They, there's a line right there that goes across, which is the average annual temperature between 1950 and 2014. So those are the years represented. These bars are five-year intervals. So the first bar, for example, in 1950 is below the average of that annual, the average over the 64-year um, period and every bar is five years. So if we look at the beginning of the interval, the temperatures are cooler. If we look toward the end of the interval, the temperatures are all warmer than the average. So this tells us the temperatures are going up. Let's look at a few uh, crucial sorts of measurements. Uh, the number of days over 80 degrees in Maryland. Again, at the beginning of the interval, lower than the average. At the end of the interval, higher than the average. We're having more days over 80. How about days over 100? More days over 100. In fact, a lot more days over 100. And then what about the nights? The nights, number of nights over 70 degrees, again, less than the average at the beginning of the interval, more than the average at the end of the interval. We have more nights over 70 degrees and more nights over 80 degrees. Um, so uh, what we're seeing is um, average, average temperature increase, the maximum and minimums are increasing in all seasons, and we're getting increases in these crucial uh, measurements of days and nights over certain um, certain uh, temperatures. Um, this is a uh, picture that was produced by the Climate Smart Farming Program at Cornell that Tony mentioned. Um, what happened to my cursor? Oh, it, yeah, it was, 
blending into the green there. Um, okay, there it is. Uh, and what you can see for our area, our area so here's Maryland, um, is, uh, well, let's look at the scale. Uh, this is zero. This is zero. So um, the green is 100 to 300 days more, um, 100 to 300 more growing degree days. Um, yellow is 300 to 500, et cetera. So if we look down the eastern shore, there are a lot more growing degrees, degree days. This is for 2016. So this is not a projection. This is an observation of what happened last year. Hundreds more growing degree days accumulated on the eastern shore. You know, not so much in the Piedmont. Um, but still some, and this is the urban heat um, effect probably, um, but, but we still have more growing degree days. If we look at a specific place, this is Caroline County, um, Maryland on the eastern shore, we can look at the accumulation of growing degree days through the season. Um, I'll just show you what these lines mean. The black line here is, uh, these are essentially the, uh, the sort of uh, boundary extremes. The uh, purple line is the 30-year average, 30-year normal. The blue line is the 15-year normal. And the green line is what we saw in Caroline County for 2016. So what you can see is um, all the way up maybe till around uh, mid-July, things are going pretty much as you expected on the 30-year average. Uh, slight deviations. But as you get into August and then into September, you see the growing degree day accumulations really start to accelerate. Um, leaving the 30-year average in the dust, and then by September, leaving the 15-year average, and by November, almost up at the most ever um, observed. So um, uh, you can get these kind of data for your county uh, from the Climate Smart Farming uh, website at Cornell, and I would encourage you to go play around with this. It's, it's really pretty interesting. Some counties are not nearly as extreme. Remember, I showed you the eastern shore um, had the biggest change in growing degree days. If you look for, say, Howard County or Prince George's County, you wouldn't see that difference. Um, so we're going to continue to talk about the effects of climate change um, through temperature. And the, first, the next thing I want to discuss is the change in the frost-free season. So here in the Northeast, and Maryland is grouped with West Virginia and the other Northeast states, um, we have, on average, 10 degrees um, uh, fewer uh, winter days, basically days with frost, than we had um, in a period um, between the average period between 1901 and 1960. Other areas um, are in the U.S. are different. California, wow, a whopping 21 degree longer season. So what we see is spring comes earlier. There are fewer cold nights for plants that require chilling like fruit trees, um, and that can be a real problem. Um, and it already is a problem for states uh, farther south of us. And yet it does give us maybe an opportunity as the season is longer to add in and uh, uh, to change the rotations that we've been using, add in maybe an additional crop, or at the very least have the opportunity to get more out of the cover crops that we plant um, after, uh, after corn and soybeans. So warmer winters um, mean earlier blooming. Um, February this year, 2017, was the warmest February ever, and then we all know that, uh, I think it was the first or maybe March 8th or 9th, I can't remember exactly, we had a very hard freeze for a couple of days. So this is extremely problematic for fruit trees that may have uh, bloomed, because then this is snow, right? Uh, then if uh, a very hard frost comes, the blooms, the, uh, the blooms are killed, and then there's no crop, right? So New York apples, this is uh, information from David Wolf from Cornell, New York apples are blooming eight days earlier than they did in the 1960s. And up in upstate New York, where Cornell is, they have been increasingly caught in this um, late winter uh, snow or frost. Grapes in New York are blooming six days earlier than in the 1960s. So what happens when we get this late spring cold snap? And actually, I would be really interested to hear from any of you um, who had problems on your farm from the cold snap we just had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you might have lost any fruit crops or um, noticed any other damage, I'd really be interested in hearing about it. Um, 
I know that farmers have always experienced this late spring cold snap. They, are, they come around every once in a while. But uh, I think this is going to be a problem that will be increasing as we um, go further and further into climate change because the plants are going to start blooming earlier and earlier. Um, and that makes them more vulnerable. Um, the uh, USD Northeast Climate Hub has a vulnerability analysis for the Northeast agriculture, and I'll show you that later and tell you where you can get it. But one thing they suggest is if you're planting new orchards, obviously fruit trees are in the ground a long time, so you can't move them. But when you're planting new orchards, you might consider not planting them in um, hollows or low-lying areas where the frost is going to occur first, but maybe plant them on higher areas. And also, um, as longer season varieties um, uh, begin to be introduced, it might be worth considering those because they may be more robust to some of these um, uh, frost levels. Okay, so warmer winters and earlier springs also affect the insects. In fact, the insects really love this. Um, they show better overwintering survival, those insects that typically overwinter here. Um, they come out earlier. In fact, I saw my first cabbage white butterfly in my backyard yesterday, which is bizarre because there's nothing for that animal to eat out there right now. But um, there it is nonetheless. Um, insects are coming out earlier. There are more generations a year. Many insects are expanding their range, which means that some insects which have not been able to overwinter in Maryland will be able to overwinter. Um, and I would just like to point out these two last parts. It's really important to be vigilant and scout, either get your people who scout for you out there or get out there yourself and look for these insects um, out there because it's, uh, you won't you won't expect them to be there as early as they are. So it's it's important to get out there early and expect the unexpected. Be ready uh, for early infestations. Um, uh, to control insects, it's um, important that we use all of our uh, collection of tools in integrated pest management. And of course, natural enemies. Um, uh, which include predators like ladybugs, okay, um, and lace wings or surface flies, uh, but also parasitoids, like I love this one, this is a little trick of grandma, uh, wasp parasitoid, laying an egg uh, inside um, uh, um, some kind of lepidopteran egg. Uh, and they really do a number on these things, corn earworms and, and whatnot. Um, we want to create environments on our farms that are congenial for these organisms because they come in and they take care of the pests um, and really help us out. Um, this is a commercial setting in California where they're growing celery and they figured out out there that if they planted uh, bachelor buttons that would attract the beneficials that are most damaging to the aphids that um, attack that celery. So they really did themselves a favor and every fourth row or so planted a row of bachelor buttons. That means if you have a lot of natural enemies, you don't have to rely so heavily on chemical inputs, which um, is saves money and is just generally beneficial. Um, there are a variety of plants that are uh, friendly um, environments for natural enemies, and so it's always worth considering planting those plants in borders, uh, even between rows, around fields, wherever. Um, one thing that I think is not very well appreciated is that um, Species respond differently to, the, to, to warming, and this is going to lead to mismatches in the timing of species interactions, both um, host and parasitoids, like shown here, but also pollinators and their, and, and their plants. Um, some species will, um, in this case, add a generation, and this is an example of, of uh, uh, parasitoid on corn earworm, and this, this example is from New Zealand, but there's no reason why it may not happen just this way here. In this case, in New Zealand, this is the time scale over the summer, it used to be two generations of corn earworm, okay? And its parasitoid wasp was synchronized so that when the peak of caterpillars were out there on the corn, the, the wasp population was at a peak ready to lay eggs and the caterpillars depresses the population and then came back. So everything was synchronized very nicely. And these species interactions have evolved over millions of years. And so it's, uh, it's not going to be easy to put these back. What's happened in New Zealand is 
the corn earworm has added a generation, but the wasp has not. So the first generation, everything's okay. There's wasps to control these guys. But the second generation, nope, there's lots of caterpillars, very few wasps. So the word on the street in New Zealand is don't even think about planting your corn too late because you're not going to be able to control the corn earworms. And th this, these pictures on the left just show you uh, for a different, um, um, a different species, this is tobacco hornworm, of course, and uh, the uh, parasitoid eggs, many, many parasitoid eggs are laid in this because they're huge caterpillars. Um, and the parasitoids grow up in there, uh, the larvae eat the caterpillar, then they come out, they blast through the cuticle, it's kind of gross, but they make their pupil case in the outside, and then they have a trap door and they come out. Um, so parasitoids are really helpful, and if you uh, can encourage them to be on your farm, in your garden, it's uh, really helpful. Warmer winters and earlier springs are also great for weeds. Um, weeds and invasives in general are doing really well under climate change. They overwinter better. Um, they, uh, they come out earlier. Um, they flower earlier. And again, um, you may see weeds that you don't expect. Weeds are moving into the area that haven't been here before. So you need to expect the unexpected. They'll be out there before you know it. And it makes mulching um, very, very important. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, cover crops are really our friends here. If we have some, sometimes you can plant cover crops right between the rows, which outcompetes the weeds. Or you can plant crops into the previous season's dead cover crops, which acts as mulch, which is very handy. Um, okay. So let's move on in temperature and talk about summer heat stress. Um, High temperatures are really hard on many vegetables for pollination. Sweet corn um, has a big problem with pollination when it's too hot. Uh, and this is a picture and references an article from Gordon Johnson, uh, who's an extension specialist in Delaware. Um, and um, I'll show you in the next slide, tomatoes have the same problem. Um, but um, scald on the fruit is also very a huge problem. So here's some scald on, on uh, strawberries. Uh, here's scald on peppers, scald on corn leaves, and what this means is when you get scald on the leaves, you lose photosynthetic area, and obviously when you get scald on the fruit, it really wrecks the fruit and reduces marketability. Um, one thing I recently learned is that scald can have long-lasting effects. This is a picture of an apple tree which was attacked, not attacked, but it was affected by scald, and later on that damage in the trunk served as an entry point for a disease. So you, we, uh, this, this perennial crop, you can think of it like that, um, was, has now been damaged for many years by one episode of scald. The other uh, issue that's very common in vegetables, potatoes uh, and watermelon, is ozone damage. So, um, you know, ozone um, levels increase during the summer when it's warm because um, ozone is... Uh, is uh, produced by a reaction between other chemicals that uh, um, occurs more in high temperatures. So as temperatures increase, ozone damage is going to increase. Uh, and this is what ozone damage looks like on a watermelon. In fact, I became aware of the air pollution in Howard County, where I live, uh, which I didn't think was very, I thought we had pretty good air in Howard County because we're west of Baltimore. But I went to my garden a couple years ago and saw this on my bean plants and said, I don't even know what that is. And I went and looked it up, ozone damage. So um, it's definitely a problem now. And the vegetable folks tell me that they see this very often in, in watermelon. Um, Tomatoes are not able to pollinate if it's uh, successfully pollinate if it's too hot. And what happens is, and I'll show you this in the next slide. I'll explain it then. Um, this is an experiment. Let me get my uh, arrow. Okay, this is an experiment that was done um, down in Upper Marlboro by Jerry Brust, who's our IPM vegetable specialist at Maryland. And what he did was he shaded some tomato plants and then left some unshaded. And then at the end of the season, collected fruits, okay, from the shaded and the unshaded. And you can see the fruits look much better in the shaded, okay, much worse in the unshaded. This yellow shoulders in tomatoes is a, is a common symptom of heat, um, heat problems. The shaded, you can see the plants look better, they're greener, the unshaded look terrible. Um, tomatoes don't pollinate when it's too hot, so you often see, if you cut open a tomato, you see 
hollow chambers where there's no seeds because they didn't pollinate. And from the outside, I call this the Pentagon tomato because it sort of shrivels in where there's no seeds, okay? So you get this little shrivelly look. And you also get this fibrous white material. So the, the quality of the, of the fruit is definitely compromised in high temperatures. Also, uh, peppers drop their flowers and drop their fruits when the day temperature is over 90 and the night temperature is over 75. This is from um, Texas A&M. Corn and soybeans also show heat stress when you have very hot days in um, uh, in corn, I lost my thing again. Um, I, don't, I don't know where my cursor is. Sorry, I lost it. Um, but on the right-hand side here, um, you can see what happens. You get leaf rolling in corn. Most of you who grow corn, I know you have observed this. Um, and this can be very damaging because the rolled-up leaves don't photosynthesize. And it can cause huge yield loss, 1% for 12 hours of leaf rolling, but if the plant is at soaking stage, you can get 12% yield loss in 12 hours. Uh, a longer duration of heat, so a heat wave, more loss. Also, pollination fails in hot weather. You guys see my cursor, I'm gonna point here. All right, there we go. Um, so you get ears that look like this. The top part didn't pollinate, then down here it pollinated and many, ear, many kernels were aborted. Um, if, if the temperatures were too hot. And so you get these terrible looking ears, obviously uh, uh, not economic. Um, soybeans, so the kernels abort. Soybeans, um, when you have very hot temperatures over 90 degrees, it reduces the formation of pods. So again, it's going to cut into the yield very dramatically. Um, this is information from the National Climate Assessment. Tony referenced this really useful document. Uh, for corn and soybeans, this is the change in yield uh, just relative to the average between 1980 and 2007. So this is a fairly recent thing. Uh, corn yields go down when it's warmer and drier. Soybean yields go down when it's warmer and drier. And yield in heat is also reduced. So you get yield in wheat, excuse me, is also reduced. So instead of getting this nice um, head, you get these little ones with very few kernels. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Uh, this is somewhat uncharted territory, but I think it's really worth experimenting a little bit. And one thing that would be worth trying is planting earlier in the spring. Okay, If you can, we'll talk about water in a minute. And uh, for fall crops, plant later in the summer. I think it's worthwhile staggering planting dates to hedge your bets because um, you want to plant early to beat the heat, maybe beat the insects, but you might not be able to plant early or you might get washed out by floods if you plant too early. So staggering the planting dates will help you manage risk, even though if you could pick, if you knew the best planting date in advance, it would be best to plant everything on that date. You don't know it, so you want to hedge your bets a little bit. Mulching, really important, keeps the, um, especially silver mulch, uh, like this. this is silver mulch, or you can use white mul plastic mulch. I don't really love plastic mulch, but those keep the soil cool, or plant material keeps the soil cool. Um, and that's very important for the plant, because it mostly cares whether the roots are, are hot or cold. Um, some um, uh, seed sources are now selling um, varieties that they say at least are heat tolerant. Um, I think that's worth a try. And you can, um, again, for vegetable farms, especially smaller vegetable farms where you have the opportunity or you have the labor to build some shade, that's really worthwhile. Um, if you're growing in a tunnel to put a shade cloth on it, that's very important um, because that could make all the difference in, in your crop if it gets really hot. Um, this is an interesting study that was done on tomatoes. Um, breeding heat-tolerant varieties that can pollinated high temperatures. So this is regular tomato, uh, sorry, this is regular tomatoes up here, normal, and um, I'm sorry, this is heat tolerant tomatoes on the left, pardon me, non tolerant tomatoes on the right. This is temperature, normal temperature. Here are the pollen tubes growing, everything's good, right? Pollen tubes are growing, pollen tubes are growing. When it's hot, the, uh, the heat tolerant plants have okay looking pollen tubes, not great, uh, but the non heat tolerant plant, nowhere nothing gets pollinated. And so this is a plant breeding advance that may be helpful for vegetable farmers. Again, this isn't commercially available yet. Um, 
Some orchards have tried evaporative cooling. Um, this is an example from an orchard in uh, British Columbia, Canada, where uh, that lost a large fraction of their crop one year to sun scald. Uh, the next year they installed evaporative cooling and um, saved their crop and evidently quite a bit of money. So again, this seems like a big, um, a big ordeal to go through and a big expense, but if it's going to be hot every year and you're going to lose your crop, you might want to think about implementing some of these kinds of changes. Um, let's talk about livestock for a moment. Um, I've been told that the audience of this webinar is fairly diverse, so if there are any dairy farmers out there, you probably already know that dairy cows do not like hot weather. Um, and uh, you can find a heat stress, it, they call it a temperature humidity index like this. You can find these anywhere on the web. Um, the problem for the dairy cows uh, with high temperature and humidity um, is that they um, suffer reduced fertility, very important, reduced milk production, and if you get into really bad uh, bad situations, even death. So this is a, a, a basic a chart which shows you that uh, this is a stress, stress threshold. Mild to moderate stress is in this here, this region here, um, and you can see it, it, if the humidity is low, you can get hotter, but if the humidity is high, they start to go into stress at, you know, 80, in the 80 degree range. Um, Severe, moderate to severe stress, again, can start at, you know, the high 80 range if, if the humidity is high. So this is a very real problem uh, for dairy farmers. Um, what do you do about this? Well, uh, the first thing is to make sure you have shade for your animals, okay? If you have to build a shade structure or if you have, uh, on most commercial farms, I'm sure they, they need to build shade structures like this. You can add fans. You can see there's ventilations in here. Uh, even though these cows are basically outside, um, uh, ensure that there's plenty of water and that the cows actually drink. And so some things I've read suggest, you know, put in some electrolytes or something that will make the water taste better to the cows so that they'll, they'll be sure to drink. Um, another suggestion is to give portion of the feed to the cows in the evening. When the cows digest their food, they generate a lot of heat through their digestion. So if you feed them early in the morning, then they're generating heat um, in the middle of the day. If you can feed them later on uh, when they might be digesting it in the evening, um, uh, that might be uh, an advantage. So it's worth giving it a try. Increase ventilation with fans. And um, in many cases, if it's super hot, you might want to do some evaporative cooling um, in the dairy sheds as well. Just got to keep those cows cool. Um, poultry. Uh, also suffer from heat stress, um, increased mortality, lost fertility, productivity losses. You can read the fine print on the, on the handout. Um, and um, lower resistance to disease. So when you get these heat stressed animals, they can also get sick, which is a double, a double problem. Um, what can you do in a poultry house? Well, you all know this already, increased ventilation. Um, move in those big fans, get, get uh, ventilation blowing through the length of the poultry house. Um, a very effective method is to insulate the poultry houses with spray foam. That's this sort of cream colored looking stuff. <clears throat> and I can um, vouch for uh, the effectiveness of this because I, I don't have a poultry house, but I have an attic and I had my attic sprayed with this stuff. And um, it reduced the summertime temperature in my attic from like 100 and 12 to maybe 88, okay? That's a big difference. And that all happens without any air conditioning or any fans or any cooling. So this is a really good investment. Um, evaporative cooling can also be implemented in, um, you know, with sprayers like I showed for the cows. Or increasingly, poultry houses are using the same kind of recirculating evaporative cooling pads that greenhouses use. At one end, you've got these, you can't really see what these are, but they're, they're sort of paper, corrugated paper pads and water drips down them. And then you've got a fan that sucks air across those and ejects it out the other side. And that is very successful. And again, much cheaper than air conditioning um, because you're using evaporative cooling if it's not too humid for that to work. Um, so that's heat by itself. Heat and drought together are a really bad combination. This um, slide shows the, uh, the potential for yield loss at different growth stages of corn. 
Um, and this is percent loss per day. So you can see on this right-hand column that you can lose, you know, pollination time, you know, six, uh, six or seven percent loss a day for um, heat and drought together. So too much um, evapotranspiration. Uh, so drought is going to be a big problem. And as Tony said, there are a number of online tools you can use to stay aware. The U.S. Drought Monitor, so I just looked this up uh, a few days ago, um, shows us uh, for March, this one, March 21st, what the drought situation looks like along the East Coast. So there's some, you know, sort of, um, what do they call it? Um, the orange is um, moderate drought. A little bit of moderate drought in the in western Maryland, um, and we're going to have some rain now, which is probably going to um, decrease that. But as Tony said, you can get a projection on um, on what future drought will look like. So this is a very, very useful tool to keep in mind if you're worried about water. Uh, what can you do to reduce your risk from drought? Well, obviously add irrigation if that's a possibility. Um, that's very expensive, but again, this is the time to start thinking about infrastructure improvements that you can make. Um, and I like to, um, not just me, but many people like to refer to some of these adaptation strategies as, as pick the ones that are no regret strategies. That is, things that you might do anyway to improve your operation, but they would be doubly worthwhile if they also um, provide some adaptation to future climate changes. Um, in addition to adding irrigation, it might be useful if you have the ability to build storage capacity um, through ponds or um, whatnot on the farm. Very important to increase the health of the soil on your farm. Um, I know everyone is always badgering you about this, but it really is important. More organic matter in the soil holds water, and that's going to be really, really useful during drought times. Um, Paradoxically, healthy soil also drains better. So it's healthy soil is good in both floods and droughts. Healthy soil has soil microbes that uh, a lot of different kinds of fungi and bacteria that help can actually help the plants fight drought on their own. Okay, and so if you have healthy soil, you can um, uh, the soil is actually helping your plants out. Um, you can plant into mulch cover crops from the previous year. That's what this is, soybeans planted into mulch cover crops. That's preventing weeds during, uh, between the rows, as well as holding water in the soil, which is really great. Plant earlier, again, uh, to miss the drought, stagger the planting dates. Use drought-resistant varieties as they become available, either through standard plant breeding or through, um, through uh, genetic engineering. And I just want to point out that some of you may have seen these um, uh, Monsanto drought guard hybrids. These hybrids are a genetic engineering product of um, transferring genes from a naturally occurring soil bacterium that if you have healthy soil, you get for free. Um, just, just mentioning. And um, so also if you're going to irrigate, obviously drip irrigation is a good thing. And I'm pretty sure most orchards have drip irrigation now. Um, in corn and soybeans, it can be hard to get that, if you wait till after harvest, it can be hard to get your cover crop large enough um, to really do any good. And if you then in the next spring have to harvest it early, you really are missing a lot of advantages of cover crops. So this is a picture taken um, from a study done up at Cornell um, where they're experimenting with planting cover crops between the rows after the soybeans have already started to grow. So this is clover, and they they um, they tried a number of different crops. You can look at it um, on this on this uh, site. Um, but what happens is this gives the cover crop a big jump start, and again, it also um, uh, helps with weed control, etc. Um, when you have a bigger cover crop next year, you have more nitrogen and more biomass to, um, to uh, kill off and then knock down and use as mulch in the next year. Um, this also improves soil health. And um, as Tony said, Cornell is, is really um, uh, leading the field in many ways in um, climate smart farming. And they have a great cover crop decision tool that you can um, answer a number of questions and it will point you toward a cover crop that might be particularly useful for your particular setting. Um, now, under drought, you might want to plant different varieties or even different crops. For example, 
instead of, in the Midwest, instead of planting corn in drought-ridden areas, areas where they expect drought fairly commonly, um, they're now growing more sorghum. That might be worth trying in Maryland. Um, in the vegetable scene, there are, you know, some vegetables uh, and fruits are more drought tolerant than others. Um, and I'd be interested to know if you all would, would like to see University of Maryland Extension put together some list of heat tolerant crops and varieties and drought tolerant crops and varieties um, for your use. And if you think that would be useful, um, maybe you could just uh, let me know about that. Um, Tony mentioned the Cornell Climate Smart Farming Water Deficit Calculator. And um, if you're going to irrigate, you really want to use your water wisely because water is going to be an increasingly uh, limited resource. So this is a good online tool to time irrigation. And this is a picture of the whole 2016 season in Centerville, Maryland, um, with respect to cereals. So what this shows you is the water deficit. So this is like um, zero. No deficit for um, the particular kind of crop. This is cereal. They can withstand a water deficit of this much. Okay. And so here we are through time, March 2016. Everything's going along great. And then in the middle of June, the plant started to really got warm. The plant started to go into water deficit. So you don't need to irrigate here, right? But you need to start irrigating. And then you put in whether you've irrigated or not, and then the tool will tell you um, when your plants go into deficit again and when you need to irrigate. So this, I think, is a very important water-saving tool and also kind of a peace of mind tool um, uh, that you can use to, um, to use your water most wisely and make sure your plants don't go into crucial water deficit like this. Now let's talk about rain. Um, on average, this is across the U.S., we're getting five inches more per year than in 1900. Um, and of course, there's a lot of noise year to year, but this trend line shows that we're increasing on average. Um, what does this look like for Maryland? So this is the rainfall picture that is the equivalent of the one I showed earlier for temperature. And it works the same way. There's an average, okay? And then um, in this case, this is observed number of rains more than four inches. The early part of the um, interval, had fewer than average rains, uh, number of rains that were huge, four inches or more. Um, at the end of the interval, we're starting to see more rains um, greater than four inches. Observe total rainfall in the spring, uh, pretty noisy, but still on average lower in the early part of the interval, higher in the end of the interval. Um, lower uh, rainfall in the summer, again, there's a lot of noise but clearly higher rainfall in the fall. So the, again, these are not projections. These are observations from 1950 to 2014. And there is absolutely no reason to expect that this um, pattern will not continue and become even more pronounced. Um, in the Northeast, heavy downpours are increasing. We're seeing, uh, we've seen over 70% increase in the number of rainfalls uh, where the rain falls really fast, um, and uh, that leads to flooding of fields. This is a picture I took in Hartford County uh, last uh, May, um, and this cornfield was way flooded. Uh, this makes it very hard um, uh, to plant on time in some cases. Um, it's hard to get big equipment in the field. Uh, it really wrecks the soil if you move your big equipment around. It compacts the soil, um, and that can cause lasting damage. Um, if you get a rain after you've seeded, it can wash it out, or it can contaminate it um, with um, toxins or whatnot that's in the, in the water. I'm running out of time here. It can stunt and kill your plants, increase disease, and if it occurs in the fall, make it very hard to harvest. I'm going to just speed up a little bit here. How do you adapt to flooding? Obviously, improve drainage, uh, improve soil health for better infiltration, prevent erosion. Uh, you don't want your top, topsoil eroding away, so use those cover crops. In some cases, you can graft um, high-value crops onto flood-resistant rootstocks. Stagger your planting dates again. Diversify your crops. And um, importantly for you livestock people, protect your manure storage because you don't want your um, stored manure to be overwhelmed by flooding. Um, spring and fall flooding again. Um, there is some headway on breeding flood tolerant crops. This is some work on breeding uh, flood tolerant soybeans at Ohio State. 
Um, this fellow works at um, uh, University of Illinois. He's breeding flood tolerant corn from um, germplasm he discovered in South America. Or this uh, fellow is in Delaware. He's doing something completely different. Um, he found that um, uh, beech mallow is both flood and salt tolerant. And it is very, very useful for poultry bedding. So he's, he and other people in extension at University of Delaware are trying to build a program where they um, explore the marketability of this new poultry bedding that could be grown on in areas of the eastern shore which are going to be increasingly flooded and increasingly salty. Um, you might use decision support tools online to decide if you want to replant, if you say your corn gets washed out, um, and the URL is down here, on the, it'll be on the uh, posted uh, PowerPoint. But beware if you go replant and the soil's wet, you might get compaction. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why that's in there again. Um, salination or uh, be, the soil becoming salty is definitely a problem that has already started on the eastern shore. Um, this is a picture Gordon Johnson took of uh, salt damage in soybeans in Delaware. Uh, this graph shows us uh, the salt tolerance of different crops. This is salt level. This is relative yield. And what you can see, this is soybeans. Soybeans really crash in salt. They don't do very well in salt at all. Wheat, barley, sunflower, sugar beet, and canola can tolerate more salt. So if you have fields that get salty either from storm surge, if you're near the coast, you, sometimes you can leach that out, but not always, or um, the rising water table on the eastern shore is bringing salty water up, you're going to need to use a salt tolerant variety or get a salt tolerant crop. They are trying to breed salt tolerant crops. These are variety trials, and you can see this, that there's a lot of variability in how well, how how good these plants look in salty soil, and they're using that for plant breeding. Um, well, I'm not. I'm going to skip this. Okay. Um, so uh, we're we're coming to the end of the talk, and I just want to uh, let you know about a few resources. Um, I've worked up a. Uh, just a little handout, a table um, of effects of climate change on fruit and vegetable crops, the kinds of impacts, flooding, drought, high daytime temperatures, and then a variety of adaptive solutions, which basically reiterates a lot of what I've said in the talk. If you'd like a copy of this handout, feel free to email me. Here's my email, svia at umd.edu. So it's pretty easy to remember or write down, um, and I'd be happy to send this to you. Um, which may be useful. Um, here are some other really useful resources. This is a report from the Northeast Climate Hub on vulnerability um, and adaptation strategies for the Northeast. And it goes crop by crop and says, if you grow corn, here are the problems you're going to have, and here are the kinds of things you can use um, as solutions. This is the adaptation uh, workbook that Tony mentioned at the end of his talk. Um, I will. Uh, just mention that this is not a very user-friendly document, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to say, um, but if you would like to work on an adaptation plan for your farm, um, I've worked through this thing and have a pretty good um, understanding of the strategy, and I would be really happy to talk to you. Um, I would like very much to be able to work up a set of case studies for Maryland that would help people use this resource. So if you're interested in this, again, just um, please let me know. I'd be more than delighted to work with you. Um, and also, um, uh, they mentioned in the introduction that um, the Ag program has started a new um, um, extension team called Climate Science for Farmers. And I've recruited about six or eight extension specialists and educators um, to work with me on this team. And we're going to be trying to compile and provide information for farmers in Maryland that will help you understand what's happening, the kinds of risks that climate change poses for your plants, and um, the sorts of things that, that you can do. So uh, with that, I, I think we've just got a couple minutes for questions, and I'll stop there. Well, thank you so much. I think that was a lot of useful information. Um, we did have one comment that said you had offered to make a list of varieties that would be useful here in Maryland. Someone said that that would, in fact, yes. be helpful. Yes. Okay. Well, we've got one vote for that. Uh. All right. If you guys have any additional questions, please get them into the questions and comments box. I'll leave you a minute to do that. 
while people are typing, um, I, I just want to mention another thing that um, uh, that people have mentioned. Did I say this about the climate of Georgia? And at the beginning, no. uh, so um, uh, I was in Caroline County not too long ago, and um, uh, some of the farmers said, "Well, you know, we would really like it." Uh, like it when Maryland gets uh, to have the climate of Georgia. So at the end of Tony's talk, he pointed out that the summer temperatures in Baltimore might be like Texas. But anyway, the word in Caroline County was that that um, we're going to have the, the climate of Georgia um, before too long. And that really worried me because by the time the temperatures in Maryland reach the temperatures expected in Georgia in the summer, we're going to have many other changes that come along with climate change, more severe weather, more variable weather, more pest problems. So I would caution you not to think that if we just do nothing, we're going to be enjoying life as they know it in Georgia because or farther south, because I don't think that's going to happen. So to, not to be, you know, put a damper on it, but there it is. Anyway, questions? Well, we had a second vote. For the document that you Oh, okay, two votes. Thank you. 